One of them, the head of army intelligence, said, who the hell do you think you are going outside of channels, making contact, and doing this openly? You can't do this. I said, yes, I can. And you know what? I'm going to train thousands of people to do it. And they are all over the world. There's nothing you can do about it. And we're going to collect all the evidence and we're going to bring it out to the people and we're going to tell the truth and we're going to bring out the energy systems that have been withheld and release the people of the world from the economic slavery of a zero sum game of fossil fuels. And he looked at me and he said, well, I said, what are you going to do about it? And he said, I guess we'll have to see. Later, I learned he was very jealous. Why? Por qué? Because this man was in a black box, a little black box, a key, nada, nada. And he was trapped. And you know what's wonderful about all of us? Because I'm nobody. I'm just a country doctor from Virginia. We're free. They don't own my soul, not the intelligence community, not the military, not the oil cartels, not the money whores. We're free. And this gives us enormous power that we don't acknowledge. And we have to acknowledge our power and now use it. So by 1993, a group of us got together and we said, what are we going to do? We can take this contact quite far. But we have to inform the people that we're not alone. And more importantly, that these extraterrestrial civilizations are here to help us and to understand us and to be here when we become a mature civilization ready to go into space peacefully. None of them are hostile, by the way. If they were, this conference wouldn't be happening. We wouldn't be breathing the free air of Earth, and I'll explain in a moment why. So I was eventually approached by some people and we started something called Project Starlight. Originally it was Starlight, then it was Disclosure Project. But when it was small and very quiet, it was Project Starlight. And if you go to, you can Google this, the Associated Press reported that the Clinton Library was sued under Freedom of Information and they had to release these documents about Project Starlight providing briefings to the president. And that was me. <laughs> So in my spare time between taking care of shootings and stabbings and car wrecks in the emergency department, I was shuttling up to Washington. They're crazy. Muy loco. However, I did so initially thinking, of course, if I gave them the information and the perspective, the new administration, the President Clinton and his people would do the right thing and end the secrecy and bring out this information. I get a FedEx to my house, and in the FedEx is a letter, and it says, Dr. Greer, you're going to be the first person to brief the president and the sitting CIA director on this subject. And I turned to my wife, and then I laughed. I said, no, impossible. You're ridiculous. This is a prevarication just to try to trick me into going and telling them what I know. They were telling me the truth. God help me. I had a three hour meeting with the CIA director, R. James Woolsey. And in this meeting, I learned that he, the president and the secretary of uh, defense and others in his administration had been denied access to the secret projects dealing with this subject. And he was virtually in tears because he learned that the presidency and the executive branch of America had been decapitated, cut off. This is precisely what Eisenhower warned about when he said, beware the military industrial complex. He was not anti-military. He was talking about this secret government complex that would hijack this and other issues and lie to the president. And for this reason, we learned that the administration was terrified of dealing with this. Ultimately, we put together a very large briefing document, about 600 pages. Most of it is in the DVD, two-hour DVD. You can go to disclosureproject.org and get it. You can get whatever I gave to President Clinton. And you will see that 
we gave a number of recommendations. And at the end of my meeting with the CIA director, I said, look, here are some recommendations of what the president can do to fix this huge problem in the secrecy, bring out the technologies and what have you. And the CIA director, Woolsey, turned to me and he said, how do we disclose that which we don't have access to? It was a terrible moment. Terrible, really. <laughs> now, I'm one of the few people living who has had these sort of meetings. And in the aftermath of this meeting, I learned that the president himself had been denied access as well as his chief of staff and others. One of his friends later came to my home and said, Dr. Greer, the president's very supportive of what you're recommending, but he's concerned that if he does this action, he will end up like John F. Kennedy, assassinated. And I burst out laughing. Ah, ha, ha. I, started, I thought he was joking. He was not joking. He said this in front of my children. I have four daughters. And I thought, my God, be quiet now. And at that moment, I realized I had really stepped into a situation. <laughs> so that was in 1994. Subsequently, I had provided briefings for people on the Senate Intelligence Committee, members of the Joint Staff. Later, I briefed the Head of Intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as the Head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And in each of these, in every case, these were men who were in very high position within the National Military Command hierarchy who had been deliberately denied access to these projects. Now, many people have a hard time believing this. I have even been recently providing briefings to a G8 country, one of the major industrialized countries, their Ministry of Defense and their head of state. And they did not realize that America had gone so far off course. Now, I take no pride in telling you this, my family were some of the original founders of the United States. We were the original prisoner of war with the British. No offense to the British, love you, you're great friends now. But it was an amazing experience to see to what extent our democracy and our experiment in freedom had been hijacked by a group of people who arrogated to themselves this knowledge, which belongs to the people of the earth, the whole earth. We are ready for this. 80% of Americans believe these are real, these UFOs, and that part of the government's hiding it. When I started the Disclosure Project, it was only 35%. When I first briefed the CIA director, only a third of this majestic group, the super secret group that keeps this information secret, Two or three hundred people, I know some of them, I've met with some of them. Now, 70% of them want this out. The other 30% want to see me go away, as you can well imagine. I'm not going anywhere unless they take me out in a coffin. Because I am dedicated to getting this truth out to the world, making peaceful contact, and bringing out the technologies to establish a sustainable and peaceful civilization on this planet. But we can only do it with your help. Thank God for Pepon and all of these people who are doing this in Spain. Excuse me for taking my jacket off. It's mucho calor aquí, no? <laughs> Oy, I'm a bodybuilder. Um, okay, so, <laughs> loco americano. Uh, <laughs> you have to keep yourself strong to do this work. I'm an old guy anyway, I have two grandchildren. So anyway, the point is that I'm making is that over the course of these years, we continue to make contact and yet we continue to find that the governments of the world were either afraid or in most cases completely uninformed in the control of these projects. Now, it is different in Europe than it is in America. And let me explain why. 
The United States has a black budget, a secret unacknowledged budget. And the proper term is an unacknowledged special access projects, USAP. These are projects for which there is no constitutional oversight by Congress and no knowledge by the president, completely. At this time, between 100 billion and 200 billion US dollars a year, every year, are going into those projects. That is more than the defense budget of any other country in the world. In other words, America's Department of Defense and Intelligence community loses more money than any other country spends. This is nuts. We don't even have health care in America. So the situation has become so out of balance that it has got to be corrected. And this is the situation, how serious it has become. I want you to put up on the screen, if you will, the secret document. And I'm going to explain this to you. This document is from the National Reconnaissance Office Central Security Service. The National Reconnaissance Office is the top secret spy agency that has satellites, many of whom are trained on tracking extraterrestrial vehicles with advanced weapon systems to destroy them. This is a crime against humanity. This is a, a restricted special security advisory blue fire. And here's your distribution list. Look at the second one, Royal Ops. Look at this one, Cosmic Ops. I think Bob Dean may have told you about the Cosmic Clearance. Here it is in a 1991 document. Now this has not been declassified. I have thousands of these. <laughs> don't ask me where I got them, because I'd have to kill you. No, I wouldn't kill you, no, don't worry. Just joking. <laughs> I hope people have a sense of humor. You better get one. Uh, Magi Ops. This is Majestic, Mag Ops, Magi Op, Comsec Ops, and it goes down. And here are some of the code numbers. Now I want you to look at these. Red Flag Military Operating Center, Dark East Military Operating Center, Dark South, Pahoot Mesa. That's in Area 51. No one calls it that in the business. Sally Carter, Groom Lake, Dreamland, Ground Star, Blackjack Team. Blackjack Control is at Edwards Air Force Base and that facility. I know where all these are. I meant the most of them. Roulette Team, Aquatech, Sea Spray. This is near the top of the document that I gave to President Obama and his Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, and his new CIA director. It is also a document that I had shared with a man an admiral who was J2, the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Intelligence Directorate, an admiral. And when he found, I'm not going to say which one, but he found through this document that he had never seen and had no access to, an operational program inside his command at the Joint Staff level that he knew nothing about. Now this is the Admiral in charge of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States of America. Knew nothing. He called them up. Now this, he told me this personally. I took Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, into this meeting. Because I was sharing this information with Edgar Mitchell back then, before he came public. And one of these operations was under his command and he called them up and he said, I am Admiral so-and-so and I want to be read into this project. Read into means briefed, it's military speak. And you know what happened? The people on the other side of the phone said, yes, Admiral, we know who you are, but we cannot discuss this with you. You do not have a need to know. And he was furious and he said, God damn it, if I don't have a need to know, who does? I'm the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And they said, sir, we cannot discuss this with you any further. Click, cut the line, blocked him. Such are the things I have witnessed. This criminal enterprise that has kept this secret is a threat to the survival of the human race and of the earth.
And you need to understand that the majority of people, even in the military establishment in America, and in the Senate Intelligence Committee, and in the White House, do not have access to these projects, and when they learn of them, they are either threatened or blocked. So this is a serious problem. And this is why the president of Spain, if he is listening, and the president of France, and Great Britain, and China, need to gather together with Mr. Obama and show him some sympathy because the situation is dire in America. And say, we will stand shoulder to shoulder with you if you will step forward with us and end the secrecy and get these projects under control and bring out the promise of these new technologies and we will restart our civilization on a sustainable path. Now they may not do it. If they don't do it, guess what? It's gonna happen anyway. We have reached the final countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, tilt of this civilization behaving the way it has. And in its transformation, we're going to see a civilization that will no more resemble today than today resembles 10,000 years ago when there were cavemen. That is how much change is imminent and it will happen rather quickly. So fasten your seat belts because we're going on a ride together. The people of the leadership of the world ultimately need our guidance. They need our prayers, but they need our insistence that they lead. The problem is everyone wants to be first to be second. No one wants to stick their neck out on this. When I put these briefings together, Lawrence Rockefeller hosted the Clintons at his ranch, the, one of the old Rockefeller guys. And he, he wanted the, the truth out, but his brother David Rockefeller, Chase Manhattan Bank, didn't. <laughs> doesn't. And Lawrence was the philosopher of the family. He went to Princeton with McDonald, old man McDonald of McDonald Douglas Aerospace. And Lawrence really did want to get this fixed, but he got surrounded by people from the CIA that took all of his money and flushed it down the toilet. But when he was hosting the Clintons at his ranch, and he was going through all these materials that we had put together, Hillary Clinton stood up and said, stop. We don't want to hear any more. This is too dangerous. And that was the end of that. So by 1998, I had concluded that neither the Congress nor the President, nor the United Nations, and I had met with the Boutros Ghali family, the UN Secretary General, were going to stick their necks out on this. It was too hot to handle. Therefore, we did the Disclosure Project, thanks to Dr. Bravo and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who helped us do it. And that's why we're here today. It has launched a worldwide push for disclosure. It's even become a branded coin term. But what we're finding is that the Danes are releasing their documents. The French are releasing some of theirs. Even the United Kingdom is. The United States, mm -mm. They can't even find the footage for the landing on the moon. Now, everyone thinks that just because you're in the CIA or something like this that you know about this stuff. Nothing could be further from the truth. Most of those guys couldn't find their ass in a well-lighted room with both hands. <laughs> but, but, but here's another interesting fact. <laughs> the extraterrestrials are visiting us. And in the last six months, the C-SETI initiative has had unbroken constant contact. Unbelievable. And I am certain that it will continue until we have reached the conclusion of this journey, this phase, this chapter in the human adventure. And I invite all of you to become ambassadors 
to the universe with us. You can all do it. And I'm going to get into some stuff here that may make you uncomfortable. You want to get into some strange stuff? Yes. Do you? Okay. All right, here we go. A prelude to this. I, I, recently, there was this spook, uh, this guy at the CIA who surfaced. And he's in charge of WSFM at the agency. Everybody, anyone who know what WSFM is? I'm training people a new word. WSFM. It stands in English for weird science and frickin' magic. <laughs> and that is actually what it's called in the classified world in America. All the technologies and all the things that deal with trans-dimensional physics. Things that go faster than the speed of light. Things that resonate at resonant frequencies beyond matter, beyond the electron, beyond the speed of the photon. And guess what? Most of what exists in the cosmos is resonating beyond the speed of light. Now we're going to get into some interesting stuff. Let me go back to 1993. And I'm having this dinner with the CIA director and his wife and my wife, God bless her. Can you imagine putting up with this? Plus, how many doctors' wives let their husbands leave their career to do this craziness for free? Anyway, she's a saint. In the Peace Corps, they called her Saint Emily. She's an amazing woman. And we're sitting there, and the cover story for this meeting was a dinner party. The hostess didn't even know who was coming to dinner because her husband said, I can't tell you who's coming till dinner till they get here. And of course, who shows up? This expert on extraterrestrial intelligence and UFOs and the sitting CIA director with his wife. Ah, but Dr. Woolsey, who was the wife of the CIA director, was the chief operating officer of the National Academy of Sciences, the most prestigious scientific entity in America. And I thought, oh, how fortuitous. She asked the question that I almost didn't answer, but I'm glad I did. Because she said, look, how are these civilizations communicating across the vastness of space? And I thought to myself, do I tell her the truth and lose all credibility? <laughs> or do I sound scientific and tell her a lie? I said, no. She asked. I'm going to tell her the truth. So here is what I told her. Look, the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. That's the distance that a beam of light going at 186,000 miles per second covers in 100,000 years. Enormous. But that's one galaxy out of billions of galaxies. And I said that if a star system in our neighborhood, which is only a thousand light years, 1% of the way across the Milky Way galaxy is visiting Earth, and they are, if they were using AT&T or whatever your telecom is here, using the speed of light, for them to call home and say, hello, how are you today? And for them to get the answer, fine, thank you very much. That just took how long? 2,000 years, round trip. The time since the birth of Christ to say hello and how are you? Fine, thank you. The speed of light is too damn slow. A priori, the technologies, all interstellar technologies are transdimensional. And the heart of that science is consciousness because they have technologies that interface directly with thought, coherent thought. Like a laser is coherent light, like this. This is a laser. So what I am now telling you is that we have sort of discovered, as many others around the world have over many thousands of years on Earth, the Rosetta Stone of extraterrestrial contact. And it isn't the SETI project. <laughs> it, it, is, it, it is not radio telescopes, it is not rockets, it's not microwave antennas, it's not even pulsed microwaves. They are, they are technologies 
that are WSFM and they're transdimensional and they cross straight into consciousness and thought and awareness. And how many people here have had some contact with an extraterrestrial spacecraft or being and there has been a mental component to it? How many? I just want to see. With consciousness or thought. It is the most common way. Moreover, the most common way that they will contact humans is in the lucid dream state. Oh boy, here we go. Now this is going to get crazy. What is this? Dreamland. Now I'm going to tell you a reason why it was named this. Because when you are on a man-made, experimental, alien reproduction vehicle, and they go into that kind of trans-dimensional mode, it is like you're in a lucid precognitive or a lucid dream state. It's real, but it's very dreamy because you have just phased beyond the speed of light. Now, Ben Rich, who was the head of Lockheed Skunk Works for a number of years, told us three things before he died. And Lockheed Skunk Works is where they built the U-2 and all the secret stuff. And my uncle's company was north of Grumman. And of course, though, I knew that. And interestingly, the technologies they have developed are so advanced that he admitted this to us. That number one, there are no private conversations anywhere on Earth. This is the head of Lockheed Skunk Works, Lockheed. Number two, that anything you can imagine, like Star Trek, what have you, has already been done at Lockheed Skunk Works. And number three, we already have the technologies to travel among the stars faster than the speed of light. In fact, we can take E.T. home. <laughs> now, some of the people standing around thought the old man had lost his mind. He was not kidding. And so when I was talking to the wife of the CIA director, I said, look, we have developed protocols that involve the ability to go into deep states of consciousness. The old fashioned term might be uh, nirvana or samadhi. And then remote view in consciousness where these extraterrestrial vehicles are. And then contact them with a coherent stream of thought and vector them, just like you vector a jet into Barcelona airport, them into our location. And guess what? They almost always come. Now this is what we're training people to do. You're all invited. We're going to do this in a mass contact event in the Arizona de desert in October, October 24th and 25th and 26th. And you can see what we're doing at DisclosureProject.org or CSETI.org. But the point is, is that people need to understand if it's interstellar, it's going to be strange. <laughs> if it isn't strange, it's probably a man-made device. If you see seams on it and rivets, it was made by Lockheed, or Northrop, or SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation, or any of these other things. So what I am saying to you is that each one of you carries within yourself the universal communicator, okay? And it's called conscious awareness. Erwin Schrodinger, who is the father of modern particle wave theory and quantum mechanics said this, the total number of minds in the universe is one. That is, it is a singularity. And so we see all these hundreds of people and we all have our bodies and we all have our bodies of light and we all have our individualities, but shining through that unique window in each window, each of us is like a snowflake. No two are alike is the same light of consciousness. We divide it up and we separate ourselves. But we can just as easily become still and silent and peaceful and become one again. And then from there, anything is possible. And as I had this conversation with the wife of the CIA director, she looked at me and she said, I thought it had to be something like that. <laughs> 
Yeah, she got it. He didn't. The CIA director was, uh-huh. She got it. I hope you do too. I know you all do. These are the sort of things that happen. They've gone from fully materialized craft off very near us to very strange events, to things that happen purely in remote viewing and consciousness, to things that happen on the plasma energy level where it's almost like a, you could see a craft but you could walk through it. Because extraterrestrial technologies are the ultimate WSFM, weird science and frickin' magic. And it is time for us to understand that if we can reach within ourselves and understand that these people from other planetary systems, yes, they may be 100,000 or a million or 3 million or 20 million years more developed than we are, but they're awake. We're awake. And the singleness of mind that we share is the universal field where we have common life together. We are one people in one universe. We're those people. Never forget that. How much time do I have? I want to go through a few more things. Diez minutos. No, no, they, they want to keep me on a, on a short leash. Okay. Because I'm like a big wild dog. I get crazy. Now, I want all of you to think for a moment of the next phase of what we have to deal with. I have a letter from a G8 Ministry of Defense recently addressed to my team asking us to train them to make open contact so that their head of state and their, pe and their leaders can have peaceful contact with these visitors, much like Eisenhower started to have in 1954 before the cabal started shooting at them. Many people think that there is some ongoing relationship between extraterrestrials and the secret government. This is not true. In point of fact, they wouldn't bother. What they have done in the covert government is to simulate extraterrestrial events. And there is a lot of research on this, and I'm going to say something here that will make many of you angry. But you know what? I got this expression, I have to credit Brian O'Leary for, for, for this. The truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> there is a highly classified project, and this is a big part of the information I'm having to provide to the president and to others that was hatched in the 50s, 1950s, to set up a nexus of fear so that the people of the world would accept the costs of interplanetary war. Werner von Braun himself said this before he died. And I have more than a dozen people who have been inside these covert operations that have been involved with the stagecraft needed to hoax, something that would make 9-11 look like a picnic. And they would be using the following. Alien reproduction vehicles. These are man-made devices that are anti-gravity that to any casual observer would look like something UFO. We've been making them since the early 60s or late 50s. Absolutely. Before we landed on the moon, we already had those technologies. Number two, psychotronic weapon systems. These are electromagnetic devices that interface with consciousness and can deceive people very easily. And number three, most importantly, program life forms. These are PLFs. And these are creatures that look like a gray or a reptilian or what have you, and they're man-made. I know where they're making them. I know the team. I have people who have been on the team who have created them. They are not extraterrestrial. They are alien, but not extraterrestrial. They are weird, and they're weird science, but they're not ET. This is the big hoax most people don't know about. And this is the information that I have been most threatened with providing. Because they want people to think that there's cowboys and Indians in space. That there are good aliens and bad aliens. 
And we have to fight the bad ones and have this sort of eschatological solution to the human problem. Don't be deceived again. There is no hostile intent on the part of any actual extraterrestrial civilization. And if there was, you and I would not be breathing the free air of Earth. How do I know this? Because for at least 60 years since Roswell, we have used very advanced electromagnetic systems, Tesla-type scalar longitudinal technologies, to track, target, and knock down these extraterrestrial vehicles. It hasn't been very efficient, thank God, but it's been efficient enough that there's one facility underground in Arizona near Fort Huachuca where there are nine extraterrestrial vehicles with their bodies that are stored there. This is an existential threat to world peace and to universal peace. And one of the things we are asking the president to do is to get control of those projects to the extent he can, working with other nations around the world. Because we know where their operating and tracking systems are, and I also know what are on the National Reconnaissance Office satellites that track them. It's called a neutrino light detector, and I won't go into the physics of it. Very sophisticated. Before the spacecraft has even fully materialized, they can track them. Bam. We began putting weapons in space at least by 1965. I know a man who worked with Hughes Aerospace and several other corporations. So for 40 some years, we've had them in space. Before that, we had them on the ground. And I have an FBI memo, and I've given this to the president. And it's from a field agent regarding Roswell to J. Edgar Hoover, who wanted to know what the hell had happened. And he basically said there was a new radar configuration, radar dome. Well, that's code word. Inside that dome wasn't a conventional radar. It was an electromagnetic scalar weapon. And when they switched it on, two extraterrestrial vehicles traveling near Roswell collided with each other. One went down near Roswell, the other one continued and impacted near Socorro. Absolutely. So this insanity has been going on since before I was born in 1955. And it is really a very important point that the people of the world need to step up and say, look, whatever the problems are and whatever reasons you believe these extraterrestrial civilizations are observing Earth, we cannot solve this problem down the barrel of an electromagnetic weapon. We have to do better than that. Now, I know I'm bringing up more questions than answers, because what can you do in an hour? But I want to leave you with this vision, because this is the vision that we must see in our meditations and in our prayers, and in our speech and in our thoughts. And that is a completely transformed planet, a planet where we are living here together in peace, and that we go into space only in peace. And that the technologies long withheld from the children of the earth are unveiled and are vouchsafed to the children of the earth for peaceful purposes. Because when we do that, we will end poverty on this planet. We will stop the killing of our biosphere. And we will establish a sustainable civilization where energy will be free and non-polluting. And in that new civilization. We will be able to evolve on this planet as a civilization enlightened in peace together. And from now into a thousand years from now, phasing into half a million years from now, we will become extraterrestrial people to other worlds. And this is our future. And right now, think of it. Can you hear the babies calling? the children, 20,000 generations waiting to come behind us here, 20,000 generations. That is what is waiting to come into the earth. And so it is our sacred obligation to establish a firm direction for this planet in peace, sustainability, to protect. One of them, 
the head of army intelligence said, who the hell do you think you are going outside of channels, making contact and doing this openly? You can't do this. I said, yes, I can. And you know what? I'm going to train thousands of people to do it. And they are all over the world. There's nothing you can do about it. And we're going to collect all the evidence and we're going to bring it out to the people and we're going to tell the truth and we're going to bring out the energy systems that have been withheld and release the people of the world from the economic slavery of a zero sum game of fossil fuels. And he looked at me and he said, well, I said, what are you going to do about it? And he said, I guess we'll have to see. Later, I learned he was very jealous. Why? Por qué? Because this man was in a black box, a little black box, a key, nada, nada. And he was trapped. And you know what's wonderful about all of us? Because I'm nobody. I'm just a country doctor from Virginia. We're free. They don't own my soul, not the intelligence community, not the military, not the oil cartels, not the money whores. We're free. And this, and I burst out laughing. Ah, ha, ha, I, started, I thought he was joking. He was not joking. He said this in front of my children. I have four daughters. And I thought, my God, be quiet now. And at that moment, I realized I had really stepped into a situation. <laughs> So that was in 1994. Subsequently, I had provided briefings for people on the Senate Intelligence Committee, members of the Joint Staff. Later, I briefed the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And in each of these, in every case, these were men who were in very high position within the National Military Command hierarchy, who had been deliberately denied access to these projects. Now, many people have a hard time believing this. I have even been recently providing briefings to a G8 country, one of the major industrialized countries, their Ministry of Defense and their head of state, and they did not realize that America had gone so far off course. Now, I take no pride in telling you this. My family were some of the original founders of the United States. We were the original prisoner of war with the British. No offense to the British, love you, you're great friends now. I did so initially thinking, of course, if I gave them the information and the perspective, the new administration, the President Clinton and his people would do the right thing and end the secrecy and bring out this information. I get a FedEx to my house. And in the FedEx is a letter and it says, Dr. Greer, you're going to be the first person to brief the president and the sitting CIA director on this subject. And I turned to my wife and then I laughed. I said, no, impossible. You're ridiculous. This is a prevarication just to try to trick me into going and telling them what I know. They were telling me the truth. God help me. I had a three hour meeting with the CIA director, R. James Woolsey. And in this meeting, I learned that he, the president and the secretary of uh, defense and others in his administration had been denied access to the secret projects dealing with this subject. And he was virtually in tears because he learned that the presidency and the executive branch of America had been decapitated, cut off. This is precisely what Eisenhower warned about when he said, beware the military industrial complex. He was not anti-military. He was talking about this secret government complex that would hijack this and other issues and lie to the president. And for this reason, we learned that the administration was terrified of dealing with this. Ultimately, we put together a very large briefing document, about 600 pages. Most of it is in the DVD, two hour DVD. You can go to disclosureproject.org and get it. You can get whatever I gave to President Clinton. And you will see that we gave a number of recommendations. 
And at the end of my meeting with the CIA director, I said, look, here are some recommendations of what the president can do to fix this huge problem in the secrecy, bring out the technologies and what have you. And the CIA director, Woolsey, turned to me and he said, how do we disclose that which we don't have access to? It was a terrible moment. Terrible, really. <laughs> now, I'm one of the few people living who has had these sort of meetings. And in the aftermath of this meeting, I learned that the president himself had been denied access as well as his chief of staff and others. One of his friends later came to my home and said, Dr. Greer, the president's very supportive of what you're recommending, but he's concerned that if he does this action, he will end up like John F. Kennedy, assassinated. This gives us enormous power that we don't acknowledge, and we have to acknowledge our power and now use it. So by 1993, a group of us got together and we said, what are we going to do? We can take this contact quite far, but we have to inform the people that we're not alone. And more importantly, that these extraterrestrial civilizations are here to help us and to understand us and to be here when we become a mature civilization ready to go into space peacefully. None of them are hostile, by the way. If they were, this conference wouldn't be happening. We wouldn't be breathing the free air of Earth, and I'll explain in a moment why. So I was eventually approached by some people, and we started something called Project Starlight. Originally it was Starlight, then it was Disclosure Project. But when it was small and very quiet, it was Project Starlight. And if you go to, you can Google this, the Associated Press reported that the Clinton Library was sued under Freedom of Information, and they had to release these documents about Project Starlight, providing briefings to the president. And that was me. <laughs> so in my spare time between taking care of shootings and stabbings and car wrecks in the emergency department, I was shuttling up to Washington. They're crazy. Muy loco. However, 